You're only one misconfiguration away from a breach. What are your thoughts when you hear a quote like that? I think when I hear a quote like that, it is absolutely true. It is an asymmetric problem. Uh, attackers have to find just one weakness to get in. Defenders, like the customers, have to you know have their 100% coverage. But it's not that you got to do everything perfect. Uh, there's going to be, you know, you're never going to stop attacks. You're never going to, you know, and there could be some challenges coming in. It's what is the risk of inaction? What is the risk of this access? So people are built identity systems for the last two decades. But the concept of risk of an identity, the fact if I'm giving access to Jim means I'm taking on a risk. I'm hoping Jim is a legitimate employee, he does legitimate actions, but sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes your account could be compromised. So this additional threat vector we're looking at right now means every account has a risk. This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff, and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad yourself? I'm doing great. I'm, as, oh, as always, very excited for this episode. I discovered Venkat uh, a while back at a, an event, and Ian Singh, who probably most people who are listening to this podcast know Ian. He's very much a contributor to our community on um, LinkedIn and, and various other formats as well. He introduced me to Venkat. I got to learn a little bit about the Stack Identity product. And so I'm glad we're able to kind of bring their message to our community. Yeah, looking forward to this one. And definitely want to give a shout out to Ian for the connection. He's also been a great supporter for the show. So shout out to Ian. Uh, today's episode is a sponsored episode, something that we developed these in collaboration with our friends over today at Stack Identity. Uh, if you don't know a stack identity, they are your co-pilot to solve identity security problems. We're going to find out what that means. You can learn more about them at stackidentity.com slash IDAC. And so we've got Venkat Raghavan, founder and CEO at Stack Identity. Welcome to Identity at the Center, Venkat. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jim. Good morning. So thanks for taking the time. Uh, one of the things we like to do is really find out about the background and the origin stories of people who appear on our show so let's start with that. How did you get into the IAM industry? What set up your, or ignited maybe, your passion for this sector of, of cybersecurity? Gosh, I got to go with 25 years back here. So uh, my first start was, uh, uh, I'm an engineer by trade. So I uh, built uh, early distributed systems uh, for companies. And uh, I was working on a specification called Security Assertions Markup Language, or SAML as it's very popularly known uh, these days, which is the kind of the rubric of identity today. I got pretty excited about uh, the opportunity to kind of have a common language by which you can speak identity to each other electronically. And so that got me excited. For some reason, I, I dug into this a bit more and, uh, and joined a startup called Dascom, which were pioneers in using SAML to build uh, the first generation of uh, you know identity management and single sign-on systems which powered the uh, lot of uh, Java applications back in the first days of internet era. So I had a great uh, experience uh, in this identity space. And I never left, frankly. I got to know SAML, uh, built products, uh, was part of a startup called Basca. We got acquired by IBM. And here I am still, <laughs> 25 years later, still, still digging this. So you've got a long history in this space. Let's let's talk about Stack Identity. What's the core problem that Stack Identity looks to solve for? And you know, this is a very competitive space. How do you set yourself apart from others in such a crowded market? I think it's useful to kind of go back and look at how industries evolved over the last two decades, right? I mean, when we first started Dascom and worked on the early generation of these technologies, the problem we were trying to solve was simplifying granting of access. And so that was very complicated. IT was growing leaps and bounds. And uh, people had a lot of applications to sign on to. So single sign-on, having a single password is a big, big issue, big pain point uh, that we solved. That we solved successfully in the last 25 years or so. But now the issue is granting of access is the easy part. Removing access is quite difficult, quite challenging. Why? When you remove access, people scream at you. They don't like it. 
and they feel like they've taken something away. <laughs> they were taking something away from their daily work. For whatever reason, it becomes emotional, cultural, uh, sometimes political. And so, so what happens is that if you don't remove the access under whatever pressure you're in, in companies, then what happens, there's some access for all. You have hordes of access lying around years and years, and it's easy pickings for attackers. The last hundred breaches, attackers always compromise the same pattern, a compromised identity, but with a compromised or weak credential that should have been removed, that wasn't removed. And we only find out after the fact. So the problem that Stack is solving is to kind of figure out how do I simplify and make it easy, an easy button for removing access. Uh, and so that's, I think, the innovation we're applying. And it's, it's very difficult to kind of convince people to remove the access, but we got to do that. And that's where we're empowering teams to go do that. So I love to find out also about the names of companies. How did you come up with the name Stack Identity? Well, I think if you look at at least even a decade ago, right, we were operating just Active Directory, maybe a few LDAPs. That's it. You know, today's world, companies deal with 25, 30 different identity systems. You have your, your, your AD, your LDAPs, you have uh, Intra ID, you have Okta, you have applications that have their own identities, and it goes on and on, right? So, so this fraud of identities was massive. So now we're seeing identities built into your operating systems and clouds and applications and databases. So we see stacks of identities, right, you know, all over the place. And so for customers, it's very difficult to manage all the identity populations they have. And so the stack is an aim to kind of reflect the fact there's now a distributed identity system, and it's going to be that way for the next, you know, you know several decades. How do we still bring the unified perspective of identities and what they're doing in the environment? So that's what we're trying to accomplish here with stack. You know, Venkat, I was thinking, you know, stack could also mean these stacks and stacks of entitlements that people accumulate over time. Because that's really what it sounds to me like the problem that you're solving, right? Is that this entitlement creep scenario where you keep getting more and more access, whether it's, you know, I, I don't think it's intentional, right? Nobody's out there trying to do the wrong thing. But we, you know, as, as consultants in our day-to-day -day lives, Jeff and I see uh, scenarios where companies are still doing what we call model after. So then Kat joins the company and he's, you know, backfilling for Jeff, make him like Jeff. Well, what they don't realize is that Jeff has been working here for 15 years and now he has all this different access. Um, so that's one scenario, but kind of what I'm tr very interested in is where do you fit into that, that life cycle or that workload of getting from the point where it's like you're provisioning these entitlements to now you have them and you may or may not be using them. Um, where, where does stack solve the problem is which, which part of that, that uh, workflow is it? Yeah. A great question. So you're right. It's all about stacks of identities and we should be clear it's both human as well as non-human. Because most of the time we're seeing a new era of machine identities coming in, workloads and whatnot, APIs, AI applications, and so on and so forth. So we have stacks of identities and stacks of permissions, stacks of you know, privileges, stacks of policies, right? So that's, that's a complete you know, mess we have. So granting of access is easy, right? Many tools do it effectively. So we're not solving that problem. Once access is granted, what happens on day two, day three, day five, day 10, day 100, you know, are you using the access, you know, are you some of, are you, you know, do you have more access than, than necessary? Um, you know, do you have privileged access that's not required? Um, and so we look into how do we understand and, and, and help customers understand where are they over permissioned in their environments? Uh, where are unusual access patterns, unusual behaviors of access? Because anytime there's an access, there's a risk of, somebody doing an exfiltration or an attack on your critical systems. So we are always focused on continuing to understand the access attack surface and always helping you to automate the reduction of this. So the primary goal that we're trying to solve is post-grant of access for any identity, machine or, machine or human, how do we make sure they only get the right access for the right reasons, for the right duration, for the right purpose, and that's it. And and tell customers to kind of continuously operate in this privileged mode. That's our goal, and that's our IP we built to the company. 
Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, one of the things that Jeff mentioned is, you know, he asked the question of how did you come up with the name of, of Stack? Um, I'm also interested to understand. So you've got this tagline um, around co-pilot for identity security. So what is that all about? What was the mentality there? Yeah, if you look at every CISO you talk to or, or identity leader, they will internally talk to themselves and they know they have to solve this problem. They know they have a challenge with access of access, access running amok, whether it's employees, contractors, third parties, whatever it is, they know this. But they can't put, a, put, a, put their arms around this problem. And so, so why is that? They know they have to do this, but they cannot do this because things are too complex right now, right? They have to do many different systems. Uh, they're dealing with, you know, identity systems, access control systems, applications, databases, and whatnot. So they are struggling to figure out how do I get my arms around this? Uh, and so the answer uh, for our customers is to help them leverage automation. So Copilot is the ability for us to work in concert with the customers and be almost like a, a co-pilot to the customer's environments. Watch over their environments continuously, understand where the problems are, and quickly tap, tap them on the shoulder and saying, hey, there's a problem here. So Copilot is all about the sort of the AI world of automated visibility, automated access control, automated resolutions. So customers don't have to put human labor in all those things. And so today we see many, many companies that use spreadsheets and screenshots and emails back and forth just to just to figure out, hey, is this access required for, for Jim? That's a back and forth that happens for like a couple of weeks. So Copilot takes a different approach. It's, it's entirely automated. It's data-driven. And through that approach, customers are informed of problems automatically uh, in our console. So they kind of get to see, okay, these are the areas I'm focused on. These are my exposures. These are my exploit, uh, you know, things I need to go look after, right? And these are the ways I need to resize or right-size my policies. That's the whole idea of Copilot is to give you the automation, automation layer so we can automatically detect these, uh, you know, uh, unwanted access, unauthorized access, shadow access, and help customers to kind of go through a process of fixing these things as well automatically. Yeah, I thought that was one of the points that you made there was real interesting around not only the human identities. It's, it's so easy to fall into the trap to think about identity as human beings, but there's also all these non-human identities, especially in your cloud environments. So, so let's kind of like shift into, um, let's talk meat and potatoes. So what are the um, environments, the, the cloud platforms that you guys support? And then if I'm wanting to use Stack in that environment, um, what is the implementation of, like that, of that like? In other words, how do I go about it, you know, at like a 10,000 foot level? Yeah, it's quite simple. We support all the major cloud platforms today. Uh, we, are, we are a multi-cloud and a multi-IDP. Multi-cloud meaning you support AWS, Azure, uh, uh, GCP, uh, and things like that. We also support multiple identity providers like Okta, uh, Active Directory, Enter ID. We also support identities that are built into databases, uh, database identities, database admins, and things like that. So um, the platform is a SaaS platform. It's easy to deploy and onboard. And uh, we take read-only access for a particular cloud account. Customers create a couple of policies for us and give a limited access scope. Through APIs, we ingest this data. It takes about five minutes to onboard a specific cloud account or, a, or an identity account for us, like Okta, for example. And then we do the analysis, we do the detections, and we sh the time to initial value is about 60 minutes or less. So very simple to easy to do product. We have a nice dashboard that builds trust with our customers to tell, we tell them where things are in the global population space, what are the various activities, behaviors, where are the risks of identities, what are the old permission to access. And we go through a guided process to help customers to understand, agree, acknowledge, and then take action from the platform. So forgive me for sounding a little bit incredulous, but I'm gonna paraphrase what you just said. If in about an hour, you're able to pull all this information together and really start having actionable data across GCP, Azure, AWS, various IDPs, et cetera, you're pulling that data that quickly and really starting to be able to get your hands around the cloud, right? Which is kind of like this amorphous thing, right? How do you grab a cloud, right? You're kind of 
trying to get to it, but is that, did I hear that correctly? Absolutely. I mean, I wish I could show you Devo right now, but maybe the next time or the next, <laughs> the next, next episode here. But the point is, that's the power of the cloud, right? API-based applications. Uh, you know, if you have SaaS as an API, we ingest this data. So it's easy for us to grab data, put it together. The power of our platform is not the ingestion, but the correlation, the, the detection, the analysis that we do automatically. And we can do it for very, very large accounts too. So we have customers who are kind of small, medium, and large, extra large kind of accounts. So, you know, we are able to then, the IP we built is to kind of understand and the entire populations, the challenge in this problem is always going to be, am I going to miss an island of identities lying around which I've not even touched, right? That's a problem. And that is an exposure. Customers don't have the visibility. The idea is can you get 100% visibility of all the identities across your environments? And that's what we do. So that's an important statement. It's not doing for one cloud or one platform and calling it a day. It's about looking at the entire identity populations that we live in your cloud accounts, your identity providers, your databases, on-prem, hybrid, cloud native, and whatnot. So it's the comprehensiveness of our ingestion and the correlation with the customer's complete trust and visibility. It's their data. It's their story. And we just help them to kind of get to the quick conclusion and remove all the toil of managing, you know, spreadsheets and emails and back and forth and have them manage their policies and automate via the co-pilot things they can take action quickly, right? And so the goal is to continue to shrink this attack surface, this automation, and I believe this is the way to go. At the end of the day, the customers don't have time. The resources are constrained. They're going to use technologies like generative AI, which we've employed in our technology to kind of bring this power of automation to market and, and get them to take action to kind of remove the access. That's a, that's the that's a really the more important goal, not to kind of show nice pretty pictures, but to have them take action. Hey, Venkat, I want to get your thoughts on a, a statement or a, a quote that I've heard a few times which is that you're only one misconfiguration or maybe it's one over entitled account. Uh, you're only one misconfiguration away from a breach. To me, that puts a lot of onus on the identity management um, practitioner, but I kind of feel like that just means you have to have the right tools. But what, what are your thoughts when you hear a quote like that? I think when I hear a quote like that, it is absolutely true. It is an asymmetric problem. Uh, attackers have to find just one weakness to get in. Defenders, like the customers, have to you know have the hundred percent coverage. But it's not that you got to do everything perfect. Uh, there's going to be you know you're never going to stop attacks. You're never going to you know if there could be some challenges coming in. It's what is the risk of inaction? What is the risk of this access? So people are built identity systems for the last two decades. But the concept of risk of an identity, the fact if I'm giving access to Jim means I'm taking on a risk. I'm hoping Jim is a legitimate employee, does legitimate actions, but sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes your account could be compromised. So this additional threat vector we are looking at right now means every account has a risk uh, that you need to understand and, and take action. So the focus is really not about, you know, you do the do the basics correct, right? The, you know, for example, if there's over permission access, clean it out. If there are unused access, clean it out. If there's excessive access, clean it out. If you have poor posture, clean it out. So doing the basics Correct, and having complete visibility around these basic, basic hygiene, if you will, solves 80% of the problem, Jim, in this market. Now we've got 20% to go. The remaining 10%, now we've got the hygiene done. It's, you know, you're, you're comfortable with that. Then now, now look at the next 10%. How do I look at the critical crown jewels uh, in a data, in a databases, in a customer data, supply chain, look at external actors who want to come in, you know, tighten those things up, that's another 10%. Another high, another five percent is okay. Where are my policy gaps? Where are my blind spots? You know, fix that. Now you get to ninety-five percent, pretty much. And remaining five percent is just a risk you need to accept. So by methodically looking at you know brass tacks, hygiene, configuration practices, least privilege practices, you know, you know, better posture, improved posture, and tightening your policies, tightening your guardrails education, you get to the 95% mark and then the remaining 5% is, is the risk of doing business. That's why I think about it. That way you can you can make progress. And it's never going to be about 100%, but it's always, always about having a method in place. And tools currently right now don't have this methodology. They're built for 20 years ago for compliance and audit and automation for productivity purposes. Now, I didn't speak about threat dimension. Access is a threat dimension. This is the change the market is using in the last decade. 
it's going to get worse with the arrival of AI and you know you know machine identities and things like that. So that's a new you know new thought here. So Jim, you I asked to worry about uh, life cycle. You know we have to now leverage threat as part of the identity life cycle, which we've never done before. So the notion of threat as a part of a life cycle of identity management has to be a front and center thought, and that's the that's the area we are we are pioneering great innovation around. You know, another thought that what well, you just said there triggered another thought to me, which is, you know, a lot of the cloud environments were spun up not by, not with the inclusion of informational security and the IAM strategists and practitioners within an organization. It was application development teams were given like, hey, make this happen. We need to have this data lake and this great whiz bang project and they went out and they built it and a lot of times they're not security minded so they weren't cr trying to get each account down to least privilege now this is someone says the CISO hey buddy the buck stops at your desk you're responsible for protecting our data and now the CISO he or she has to figure out oh we've got this We've got those crown jewels out there in this cloud. Now I need to figure out how to make it more secure. And I think one of the, the a great place to start is not it's not going to give you everything, but a great place to start would be to start looking at, especially those machine accounts, but all accounts, which ones are over provisioned. A great point. Yeah, the power of the cloud, right, is automation. That's how the Cloud, we love the cloud so much. It's a tremendous amount of power, right? I mean, things like using, for example, you know, you know, infrastructure as code, like Terraform, for example. You can spin up cloud in like five minutes, right? You can imagine you can spin up a database in thirty seconds. You can put up a database, right, and have and, and upload customer data and do it, right, and and go away. <laughs> the environment is quite difficult. So by by all accounts, most cloud environments are automatically over permission because of automation. You know, and developers are driven by their, their KPIs or productivity and velocity of code, not examination privileges. That's not their job. So they want to go where, where they want to build cool applications and monetize data, bring the latest AI ML model, generative AI, show value, right? And run and, and create value for the business. Security teams are pretty much on the outside and looking at this cloud. It's so fast and and and, and, and growing so fast. So when the buck stops with the security teams, they struggle, right? At the end of the day, they're not, they, they didn't have any policy control over this environment. And, and so what we're trying to do is to kind of bridge the gap, is to kind of bridge, help the security teams understand the risk of already over permissioned access, already, all, all the over, you know, exposures created, coming into data assets, because it's so easy to spin up a data asset of the cloud and build an application to share data. So data sharing is, is, is ubiquitous, like, Imagine how easy it is for us to you and I to share, uh, you know, a, a Google Sheet, right? Or you know, it takes two minutes for us to create a spreadsheet or a doc and share it with you. Done. Imagine now you're you're sharing the same terabytes of data. In that, with a lot of simplicity, I can share my Google Drive or my Snowflake instances <laughs> to my third parties and do interesting applications. So, in addition, in two minutes, you have changed the world from a you know kind of a highly change controlled environment to a completely in you know, a sort of a you know ad hoc way to share data uh, about customers and whatnot to various third parties uh, using APIs. So there is no visibility to these entire things. So that's why I go back to the copilot thought is we need to bring the power of automation to work to solve this problem. The very this problem is going to be automation in the first place in the cloud. So let's leverage automation and AI together to bring that early visibility, to bring that you know continuous visibility to practitioners of identity and security. So they can kind of keep up with this thing and start to figure out how they can speak about risk, right? The job of the CISOs is not to talk about, you know, not to take on risk, but to speak about risk. If this is where I'm exposed, uh, this is where the risk is, and this is where the impact is going to be. You guys take a call on this. So we're going to help CISOs and the board ultimately take a call. And these are the exposures, but now we're going to make it super simple, super easy. And, and and that's the reason why we so thrilled about talked about AI and, and 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 machine learning and and data lakes and whatnot. So this ability for us to bring that continuous visibility as things happen, you're able to respond to events and either shut it down or take action 
that's super compelling. Uh, and go back in the day of you know change management, and you, know, you have three months to do access reviews today. And people do not, don't even do access reviews today. You know, in three months, every manager hates it. And when you want to review access for your employees or your reports, you go find your favorite tool. I won't name these tools today, but you can find uh, select all a button and bulk approve. Done. It's a headache. I'm done. So nobody is examining access privileges. It should be there. So when it doesn't happen uh, through either a fraud process or a complex process, access accrues. So we want to bring in automation and simplicity because without simplicity and data, our customers will not take action. And that's the differentiating aspect of what Stack does. So how do you how do you use something like Stack to measure the success of the implementation or the data that you're getting out of it? Because you talked about risk, right? And access permissions and cleanup, et cetera. I have to imagine that you've got, you know, customers right now that are using the product. How do they measure success to know that they've gotten a return on the investment they've made? Yeah, let me give an example of this. You know, you know, our customers, when you talk to the security teams, the, even the CISO, right? Their job is to raise risks and awareness. And so now let's say they have an environment in which they found all the risks of AWS. They're going to knock on their colleagues, a VP of engineering who owns the cloud. Hey, you got to go fix this, buddy. The VP of engineering says, you know what? I don't have time for this. I'll look at it when I can, right? So now we have surface intelligence and the risk. The CISO has told the, his peers, you got to go fix it, but nothing happens. So what happens now? A month goes by, still nothing happens. Like, so now there's a back and forth, right? So what we do is it can be a bit SLA sort of the product. Now, you know, if that risk you're generating, if it's a high severity risk, it's got to be fixed within one week, right? And now we become the broker. So our ticketing mechanism includes this SLA. So now the cloud engineering VP has to respond to this. They can say, look, I accept the risk. I'll fix it within a week. I will accept the risk. I will fix it in two weeks. I will not accept the risk, escalate this to the business. So our job is to kind of make sure they come together, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate on the single platform call stack identity. The risks of, of high fidelity, high urgency has to be taken care of. And at least everybody's on the same page. That's the same data they're looking at. The CISO and the identity team looking at the same data as the DevOps or the security teams are looking at. So we're able to bring this, this collaborative platform through SLA. So at the end of the day, it's not, you know, I'll do it when I can. Let's look at the risk. And if you can resolve this at this level, we elevate this to the, the head of operations or the business unit leader, whatever it is. Our goal ultimately is to kind of keep on nudging, nudging through the SLA so somebody, somebody can actually remove the access. Until such point in time, access is not removed. We have not done a job. And that's our goal is to kind of take that last mile, help leaders and owners and stakeholders and risk managers and teams understand the risk agree on the risk, and then have deliberate plans for them to fix these problems. So measurement of what our product is, is how many of these uh, tickets have we, have we solved have actually removed the access? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? Uh, how does it happen on the last, you know, how, what is it trending? So when they see the trend lines coming down, they see value in the product. They'll be able to now you know, take a fairly chaotic environment of unbridled access <laughs> and brought it down to manageable set of issues and risks and be able to provide continuous visibility and operational fidelity around this. So that's what customers measure, right? And do it in a very automated fashion, which means they're not repurposing their teams to go do this. You know, Copilot takes it for them automatically. You talked about those nudges, and I, and I see this as well as sort of in the real world is people are always hesitant to take away access because they're not sure what it does. It's going to break something, and so they just kind of leave it, <laughs> I guess. You know, is, is that fair where we're at today, where people just don't know what they're what they're what their human and sometimes non-human accounts are doing. And so that, that hesitancy is real. How do you take something like that and say, okay, well, here's a better way to do it. Maybe there's more context around what this account does or the continuous evaluation, right, of what the access is doing and shrinking attack surfaces and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about what, why you see those nudges being needed still? And then how does that reduce the attack surface once you get through the nudge factor? <laughs> Yeah, most of the time, for example, you know, when you're trying to remove access, you don't have the full context, right? Because that removing that access could impact other downstream applications. Legitimate reasons, right? Why users could be disabled and not get access to the system. So the worry is, am I going to break something down the line? 
So the first thing you have to do is to give you the complete picture. If you remove this axis, this is going to be the impact, right, of all these systems. We build a map and we show that uh, graph. So we build trust in our data itself, number one. So the first thing is they're more confident, hey, nobody's accessed the last 90 days. Okay, you know, the, the, you know, this access is very risky. It's got a high degree of impact. Uh, you know, I think of some of the breaches that's happened over the last, you know, massive breaches, right? Uh, you know, we've seen them in a time and again. And you got to take action on this, right? It's, you know, and so, and so that's one example to kind of give visibility. The second uh, area we have helped customers is, look, even if I have to remove the access, you know, some people call it the screen test, right? You remove access on a screen. Oh my God, I need access. Okay, if you need a screen, you need to, if you're doing screen test, you go back to a URL and you, you request access again. Your access will be restored immediately. So we remove the uh, the issue of you know you know we remove the issue of you know if we if customers do need access uh, you know and, 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 and taken up for some reason we can now give them access back but now it's more just in time because you're only using it once in ninety days. So we're able to kind of bring in bring this process together to kind of institutionalize a behavioral change. It's a behavioral change, and behaviors won't change overnight. A it needs data. It needs impact to downstream applications. And what happens if I do make a mistake? Can I restore that mistake quickly? That's the third part. All three things are part of the, our platform. So the customers are comfortable. Hey, even if I remove the access, you're going to scream at me. Go to this link, request access. Within 30 seconds, we'll reprovision the access. But now we can give you a limited based access, right? Now I've culturally removed the access and also kind of give you more of a time based approach. So I've made you know, you know, great progress in the behavior and sentiments of these problems. So those are the couple of areas we really, customers like this. And again, all of this is automated. So it, it's, there's no kind of back and forth around this. So we remove the human toil, and that's a big issue. Now, these things are more complex in, in, in the machine identities, right? And uh, there's nobody to tap uh, and verify access, you know? So, uh, so we see a lot of cases, for example, when people are using machine identities and abusing it uh, as human users and vice versa. So we kind of have these all these environments where, look, Wherever there's a risk of access or an, or, or an abuse of access, where things are sort of awry, we kind of bring it back. But at the end of the day, we take a lot of pride in operationally making sure our customers are able to manage this entire problem within their culture, within their workflows, within their environments. Only then we see you know big adoption happening in our environments for customers. So you mentioned we've been talking an awful lot about the cloud. I think early on you mentioned that there were also some capabilities around on-prem systems like Active Directory and database. Are there differences in how that integration works? Is it rel relatively the same? Talk to you a little about sort of like the divide between cloud and then maybe on-prem resources. Yeah, I think mostly for cloud being such a modern platform, it's all API based. So most of the times we have very good APIs to integrate. Uh, so we don't have to have agents deployed on, on these systems. We can just use APIs. I use the cloud control plane to, to look at our data. When it's really on-prem, then there's no uh, you know native cloud, there's no cloud native way to kind of talk to the resources, right? We need some sort of a connector or an agent where we deploy uh, on the premise itself, which acts like a broker, right? Uh, to kind of to 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 look at this. So um so you know, so the, those are the areas that I think uh, you know for on-prem environments, we do need some agents deployed, but that's really a consequence of where what technology is. But at the end of the day, it's all about the universal visibility, right? The single layer that aggregates all the information together into a single place. And so we kind of build this abstraction of that, whether it's cloud, whether it's on-prem, whether it's hybrid, whether it's cloud native or you know, customer managed, it doesn't really matter. Your identities are where they are. Uh, and so we our job is to go pick up these identities and, and give uh you know give give this focus. Uh, Kenny, I'm also going to address one other issue, right? In terms of, uh, I think I think Jimmy brought this up early on around this uh, access issue, and we talk about stacks of identities and stacks of access, right? Now, stacks of access was always a problem uh, given the complexity. Now, with the stacks of identities coming in, you know, all these platforms in the cloud, enterprise, in database, and whatnot. Many cases, for example, right? Uh, you know, a user is called multiple accounts. You might have five, six, seven accounts uh, in, a, in, 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 in your system, and they could be across cloud platforms and on-prem. And the idea that everything is going to be on a single identity or a single IAM is almost impossible. Uh, that train is off the station. 
for the last 20 years, we built a system with the premise that I can manage gym Saturday in one single place. And that premise is gone. So now we're living in a world where you're going to have multiple identities, multiple personas, and multiple access. So for example, if, I, if you were to log in to a system and you, 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 you fail your passwords three times today, what is the typical response for a company? They would automatically reset a password, good practice, and they would do an out-of-band MFA challenge. Again, good practice. But nobody was going to look at whether or not these three password failures was really Jim forgetting the password or illegitimate attempt by an attacker trying to pawn Jim's account or do an account takeover. Because the fourth signal doesn't happen right away. So you have a process that's dear to password research and you move on. As a co-pilot, we watch you over these things. Hey, what happened? Wait a minute. There's now a fifth attempt happened two days later. We put the three together, two together. Wait a minute. This is now early patterns of ransomware attack on a particular account. So these are the things we're doing is really, you know, and this is difficult for humans to figure out. They, they're they not going to watch over every event every time. So this automation that we've built helps us understand what are really legitimate access patterns, what are illegitimate and un unauthorized access patterns that would indicate attacks and whatnot. So I just want to kind of add a bit of a color as well as to what we do really in, in, in a, at a product platform level. You know, it's just what I wanted to say there, Venkat, was early on with what you just said, you um, you talked about, well, you know, primarily the the on-prem infrastructure doesn't have all the connectors. I know if I was building a product right now, I'd focus on the cloud because my perspective is you've already seen cloud take a big bite out of on-prem infrastructure. And I think that five years down the road, 10 years down the road, I mean, it's going to be smaller and smaller. It's just like the same progression we saw with mainframes. I'm not saying that I think it'll ever go away. Mainframes are still around. They'll probably still be around when I retire. But, you know, it's becoming a, a less significant piece over time. So that was where I would focus. But I think there's another thing at play here, which is that the cloud environments were built in a way that tools like Stack Identity have what they need in order to do the type of analysis, right? You need to know what the accounts are, what access they have, but then you also need to know what access they're actually using, right? Because it's, it's the bumping up of those two things to say, hey, here's all this access this account has that's not at use. Why is that important? So to me, and I'm hoping you can either validate or correct me, but why is that important? Why? Okay, so this account has these seven roles that it's not using. Who cares? Well, it's about attack surface, right? It's about, hey, if I have an account out there that has it's over provisioned with entitlements and somebody gets control of that account, now they have all those entitlements. And even though the, those entitlements haven't been getting used, well, now they just open up a, a whole new door. Now that account could be taken over regardless, right? That's a totally separate control. But do you want that account to be least privilege or do you want it to have least privilege plus who knows how many additional privileges? So am I, am I, I and like I said, the cloud environment, the cloud platforms have the, the pieces and parts to make that determination. If it was, if the on-prem environment had all those things, this would have been getting done 10, 15 years ago because the, the problem existed then and people wanted to solve it then, but they just, they didn't have visibility to where all the accounts were being used. And we had SIM and we tried to pull all this information together, but everyone knew it wasn't complete. So if you just started taking access away, that's that part that you started off the conversation with. It was like, that's scary. You start yeah. taking away roles just because you think they're not being used, but they actually are being used. Problem, right? But in the cloud environment, you have a higher level of confidence, maybe 100% confidence that that role is actually not being used. Yeah, absolutely. And that's it. You hit the nail on the head. Uh, uh, you know, you know, if you look at the pattern of ransomware attacks, you know, the big one on United Health Group and all those, it's all the same pattern, a compromised identity. And then that's not enough. You need privileges and permissions to elevate yourself and laterally move across the organization. It's all about lateral movement, right? What enables lateral movement? 
it's access and privileges. So if you can cut off these links by removing access, right, and and you know, then you can you can limit the damage. You can contain the the attack, you know. And so, so understanding how identities can move within the enterprise, how can they flow, and what access they can use to get from A to B to C to D to go to the target, that's crucial. Which means that in cloud, even in regular environments, we need to look at not just the provisioned access, but how is Jim using this access or a service account using this access? That means you got to look at, for example, what's happening over a period of time. Uh, and on the time could be in you know, 90 days, for example, or 120 days. Okay. And what's happening with this, this time boundary? Now, the user, if regularly, if there's a regular role, you'll be using this account. To you know, to to do things right. There'll be some activity on this account. There'll be some actions on 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 the target resource. There could be some, you know, some uh, behaviors. But if none of them are, are present, uh, then the problem is you just under unnecessary access. So the access attack surface is really a byproduct of if you're not using the access, you got to give up the access. That should be the very simple process. If you're not using the access, you should just give up the access automatically. Now, today, we don't have these tools for, for doing this. Some cloud is make it very easy, right? But you also need two data points. One is, what's your access and are you using it? So you can automate that, 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 uh, that time-based analysis that we can easily give you without, a, without any false positive, right? We clearly, really, you're not using this access. There's proof. And so you don't need access, okay? So I'm going to remove the access. Let's say Jim says, you know, I'm going to use it once in 90 days because it's a quarterly report. Great. Then I'm going to give you a just-in-time access, a one-time access. You can just use it. So the number of ways we can look at data and we can analyze activities and behaviors and actions to then compare with your intended goal of giving access and to solve this problem. In cloud, by the way, many, many cases, because of automation, Nobody even knows why an access was granted. When we show our dashboard on our product, the first thing customers ask us is, I don't know why this happened. It's a very common refrain. I don't know why this access was given, which means there's no way for them to contemplate why somebody was given an access. Uh, maybe it's an emergency access and it just stayed permanent. So there are a lot of scenarios where, at the end of the day, it's about are you using the access? If so, for what purpose? Usage behavior is going to be important for us. And if you give them a long enough window, then we remove all the false positives. We remove all the problems. If you remove access within 30 days, that's not a good practice. You might still need the access. But the ability for us to use automation and to provide the visibility and show evidence and compare with their policies to remove the attack surface, you know, those are the things I think we can get tremendous ROI if we can do this because these are all early signals that we can kind of stop. By the way, every leader in the identity practice agrees with this. Uh, there's a survey done by one of the security group, one of the top identity groups, and 96% of the, of the identity leaders surveyed said they could have stopped an attack. They could have stopped an attack you know, had they had signals available to them. They didn't say, wait a minute, this was a complex, you know, sort of a zero day, nothing about it. So 96% are saying, look, in, uh, in retrospect, had, I, had they had a data and evidence, I could have prevented this. So that's great, you know, great opportunity for us as startups to go look at, okay, let's solve the problem and get the last file out, remove the access somehow, and then all of a sudden, right? That's why you're seeing this broad moment to more just in time. And don't even get into the problem of managing access. If you need access, anytime you get access, you know, just come in, make a request, you get access anymore. One. Anyways. No, no, it's a great point. And I think, so you, we've talked a lot about risk, and I'm wondering, I want to get your perspective on what is the biggest risk that CISOs face? Because to me, here's what it is. It's not the it's not the mechanics of all this. It's the ability to identify the risks, communicate the risks, and assign the risks to somebody other than me. And that, that look, I'm not just trying to be Teflon Don here, but reality is is either it's something I need to fix and I probably need some money to fix it. Now, if I have everything I need that I can go fix it, then I have nothing to worry about. It's completely within my control to go ahead and fix it. But a lot of times these risks that pop up are things that other people need to do um, or I need additional investment. And so I need to be able to identify those risks, 
communicate those risks. And then if I am fulfilled with what I need, then I need to be able to go and remediate those risks. But I'm wondering, maybe you give a, a more insightful response on what is the biggest risk that CISOs face? I think if you look at all the ransomware attacks, you know, we, we, you know, all these customers have tremendous amount of products, great technologies, right? And they got 30, 40 plus tools. Yet these things happen, right? Time and again, it happens. You know, it happens to great companies. But there is something fundamentally flawed here. That is, how do we understand what is the biggest risk is? And in our view, the biggest risk is access. Access that could have been prevented or revoked. Uh, and if you can have a truly, you know, you know, we're not saying that's going to be stopping all the attacks. But I think what we are saying is that that's going to be number one priority in terms of investments going forward. Because at the end of the day, you know, attacking our adversary needs access to laterally move and get to where they want to go. So, by the way, every CISO will agree with this. There's no dispute about this. Challenges, you know, I have my on-prem projects. I got my IGAs going. I got this and that going. I got PAM going. I'm looking at PAM for this. I'm looking at XY for this. So we are saying at the end of the day, the environment is changing dramatically, you know, and so... It's time to relook at uh, these priorities. I mean, people are spending a lot of money on identity projects today, even today. It's one of the largest investment categories in, in the budget. However, this, uh, this notion of risk is what is a new phenomena. I mean, even analysts, even Gartner talks about this all the time, like more to more continuous controls, risk-based control. So we are seeing this big change happening. At the end of the day, you got to look at what the risk is, speak about the risk. But you cannot speak about the risk if you don't have visibility into what's happening. You, you don't you don't you don't know to explain why something is happening. So with our you know with our you know with our uh, automation and our approach to providing easy way to look at this everything in concert, we are we, our job is to provide evidence of the risk and help the CISO communicate the risk to their stakeholders and to take action. So so that that is approach where where we feel like you know you know that you know people cannot wait for this you know process that they put in place 20 years ago, right? We have this quarterly order process where we're being access. That was done for age of Sarbanes, Soxley, and compliance. Still required, but now the landscape has changed dramatically. It's cloud first, data first, API first. We live in. Speed is not security's best friend. And, and so at the end of the day, attackers know this. They have these weaknesses. So our job is, what if I can come back and tell you within one hour your, your exposures, your exploit, your web pathways by which you're going to be exposed, your policy gaps, your blind spots, your risky accounts, and help you fix it through automation. I can generate code and do this. And now you can start and now put this and say, wait a minute, I'm going to use this product to figure out where do I need to prioritize my investments in even identity and access management, where do I invest in it? Rather than going off and building a product, look at the process. The world has changed now. So do I have the right visibility into looking at overall risks? Can I communicate these risks to my peers and to the board? Now, based on the risks, can I now focus on actions in these areas, particularly on access and whatnot that I can help you with? So this, that's a different paradigm I think, uh, Jim, we're focused on, is that we're seeing the market move towards that. Is that, you know, just look, you know, attackers are not waiting for a quarterly audit reports. They're finding a gap and Zoom, they're going in. And so we're seeing that the ability for us to close the gap, give build more assurance uh, and more confidence in, in our data and, and help CISOs broker this conversation. They're not, they cannot do it alone. They gotta talk to their, their colleagues, agree on what the risk is, agree on risk types, agree on how they can remediate, time to remediate. And these are all operational things that we can go from findings to the operations. That's the area where we feel like we can really help uh, optimize investments and get on this treadmill of getting this more continuous. Continuous access management, continuous verification, continuous detection, uh, uh, continuous tuning of policies. These are the areas we believe we can, we can, we can help customers get to the 95% quickly and manage those risks. So I think you made a lot of good points there. It's kind of like, I want to rewind one of the most important uh, security um, architectural principles is like this layers of security defense in depth, but it's the idea that you try to stop the hacker here. You try to stop the hacker here. You just keep going and adding layers of security. 
it's almost like you hear this paradigm all the time, which is if you haven't been breached, that just means you don't know you've been breached or <laughs> it's not a matter of if, but when. And the idea is that, I mean, you still look at like, what's the most common pattern that attackers use? It's phishing, it's <laughs> social engineering, right? These things have literally been around for more than 20 years and they're still the top two ways that people get access. So you almost can look at your accounts and say, they're going to be breached. Someone's going to be able to get access to them. The question is, what can they do when they get to the access? So that's that, secu- that paradigm of least privileged access and why it's so important. So I think you've made an excellent case here today for what you're doing with Stack Identity. And what I'd like to know is if our listeners are interested in playing or you know, getting more hands-on with Stack Identity, what's available to them? Yeah, we have a very easy way to assess the current risks using our Shadow Access Risk Assessment tool. We call it Sierra. So you plug it in, you connect your accounts, uh, you connect your IDPs, and again, within an hour, you get a report that shows you all the quote-unquote access fraud issues you have, right? And then kind of you start the cleanup process. You know, cleaning, cleaning up our identities and access is an important thing. And because the environments have grown so widely now, you know, on-prem and cloud and whatnot, that, that singular dashboard and singular view of single pane of glass, the command and control of all the risks that you have currently in the environment, and having a quick view of that is a starting point. Now you look at these risks and you look at uh, what do we do about next. Now you can start to kind of dig into this and figure out where you need to, where are you exposed, you know, what are the critical systems, your crown jewels, whether it's third party, all those things. But it starts with where am I today? What is the where am I exposed? Tell me that that view. Let me start with that that assessment view, and we call it shadow access risk assessment. Generally speaking, all these problems are really uh, you know a gap in access that shouldn't be there in the first place. We call it shadow access, kind of the of the shadow IT as a term. So you start with the shadow access you know discovery and assessment tool, and then that gives you the foundation to clean up all the identities. Tighten up all the weak identities, make them strong, look at all the over permission access, start to reduce your attack surface. You can start to put in actions in place based on the data. So initial thing is data gathering, data visibility, and you know, a report that gives you a way to kind of action that starting a problem. And again, it takes about one hour. So it's not that uh, big an effort to but it gives you enormous value add. I go back and yeah, look at, for true. example, the day before any breach. Imagine if you had a report of all these exposures and imagine so really tomorrow you're going to be breached. You will run fast, fast to fix those things. <laughs> so you'll drop everything and then go fix it, right? And imagine it's always a small thing, you know, an S3 bucket or a start our chart permission or uh, some lateral moment permission. Hey, I, I never thought nobody's going to use it. Oops, yeah, somebody used it. So it's all these small, small things that are very difficult to spot and it's lying around, you know, creating these pathways. Let's just blow them off, you know, in a systematic fashion. So yeah, the shadow access risk of some tools is a starting point. And customers can use it. It's free of charge and they get immediate visibility and get to see what they can do. And that gives uh, confidence in them. And then and then from there we can start to starburst with the many different ways to for them to kind of take workflows and take action. Yeah, I think that it's really great that you've made that available as a free resource to our listeners. Just so folks know, the URL stackidentity.com slash IDAC is where you can go to get right there and get that thing downloaded. Wanted to ask you one more question, Ben Cat. I know you guys are going to be at RSA. Sounds like you have a booth. What's going on at RSA? What's your presence there? A great, great plan at RSA team is super busy with this. You know, first time we're at RSA, so super excited to be there as well. So uh, we have a number of uh, you know, demos planned, uh, you know, customer sessions and meetings. So please stop by our booth. Uh, and uh, you know, we'll be running you know, demos. Ian is going to be there. So we have a lot of great team uh, you know, in, in our RSA. So super excited about this. Again, you know, at the end of the day, you know, what we are trying to look at is how do we give customers time back? How do we give customers capacity back? Those are the two things customers don't have. They're already having a lot of projects. And again, this is again, you know, complex problem. Let's make their jobs a bit easier uh, and get them the help they need 
And every CSA I talk to know, you know, knows this problem. They, they feel in their hearts they got to do something about it. But they're constrained by ongoing projects, this and that. But, you know, so we are kind of coming in and saying, wait a minute, let's give you the, the unified layer, the visibility layer, to start to look at taking some control back. And for CISA in particular, cloud has gone to the sprawl. I mean, so they got to pull rain this, rain this back and put some policies around it. So we think with our automation and our data platform, uh, and you know, you know, we can kind of really help the customers get quick time to value. That's our main focus. We'll demo this RSA. We'll have, we also have one-on-one sessions with the customers at RSA. So please tee us up if you want to you know, show a demo or discuss more. Uh, we have a great team at hand to support your RSA customers at RSA. Yeah, so Ian Singh on the spot again. He's given us a specific location where to find you. It's booth N6564. It's in the North Expo Hall. So That's right. RSA is huge, right? There's a North and I think a South Expo Hall and there's the tunnel in between where everybody has collected all their swag and they had their bags <laughs> sort of lined up there. Um, so definitely go check it out. I, you know, I think this is an area where you kind of mentioned this, Venkat. It's like, you know it's a problem. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. There are solutions out there. Stack Identity is one of them. You know, you can't claim that they're, you know, you don't have the right tools or the arrows in your quiver, right, to solve this issue. So I would definitely encourage folks, go to stackidentity.com slash IDAC. There's a link on there for Sarah, which is that shadow access risk assessment. I think you also do office hours, Venkat. If I, if I remember, there's like a link where you can actually people can book time. and Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for example, we are getting a lot of inquiries on the new SEC. It's coming up with new rules for disclosures. Now you cannot just be silent about disclosure or incident. You've got to report it within five days, and then you got to report your 8K filing. So a lot of pressure is he's putting on leaders to kind of report incidents and uh, to kind of drive these practices. So let's help you. They had all these disclosures and reports. Nobody wants to put their hand up and say, I got a problem. <laughs> but you invest more scrutiny. So yeah, definitely office hours is a way to kind of, you know, you know, bring in our knowledge, you know, any topic you can bring in uh, and sort of time with us. Uh, and again, the, one of the good things about being a startup is, you know, we have extremely knowledgeable people. We've been around the block a number of years, you know, built uh, first generation products, second generation, now third generation. So they can help customers to kind of get to the where they want to go. And that's a unique value. Beyond just the technology and platform, that's what we bring in. It's a huge amount of knowledge and approach and practicality to solve very, very thorny issues and with some deep technologies. So we're going to wrap it up there, but we were talking before we hit record that you play competitive tennis. So I'm always curious about sort of rituals or superstitions or things that people do before they get into any sort of sporting event. Um, you know, where they're competing. Do you have something like that that helps you kind of get into the zone and mentally prepare or maybe physically prepare for what's about to happen? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I think most tennis people, I would say they are. Uh, you, know, you know, for me, for example, certainly, you know, warm-up is an important aspect of a ritual, or at least 30 minutes. Uh, a mental cadence of how we're going to play out, or doing some, you know, uh, some, you know, very specific targeted, you know, drills, for the particular opponent in case. Um, and then most importantly, kind of manage my my emotions because tennis is a very one-on-one -on -one sport. For me, one of the things I do really well is uh, alternate nostril breathing, which helps me calm down a bit, about five minutes. Just kind of research my mind a bit and it's just in the next 60 minutes, it's, it's about a match. Because as you know, we're getting about every every of messages and some bad emails, all those things. So at least be in a place where we can kind of free up your mind, be calm, you know, you know, stable, you know, focus on the activity and enjoy, I suppose. So there are a few things uh, that I definitely go through. And uh, and that's one of the things I look forward to is the rituals as well. Sometimes we can't control the outcomes, but we certainly can control the rituals. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love that reminder to enjoy, right? It's supposed to be fun, right? I mean, competition is competition, but if you're, you know, playing, a, you know, tennis or basketball or baseball or football, whatever version of football that you that you like, right? You have this idea of like, this is still supposed to be a game. <laughs> You're supposed to have fun with it. Yeah. Jim, when it comes to yourself, do you have any, you know, rituals or things that you go through for if you're about to engage in something? And maybe it's not even a sport. Maybe it's just get in front of a crowd and talking or doing a podcast. Yeah, no, it, <laughs> it, it, it's definitely that. Um, and it's also whatever sport I'm, you know, it's kind of become an unconscious thing. And I think if you start to incorporate those, throughout your life, 
um, it'll happen unconsciously, which is to visualize yourself doing the activity mm -hmm. in a successful way. And you hear about it in almost every sport where some people will play the entire match or the entire game before they go out and play it and they do it very successfully. So, I mean, my fitness has really become going to the gym and everything. And it's much more like a, a very solitary sport. You're completely in control of your results. Nobody else, you're not against somebody else. Um, so a lot of times, like before I go and do a set of weightlifting, I'll visualize that set. And I don't, like I said, I don't even do it consciously anymore. I just kind of wind up doing it. Um, and I think what you said for public speaking, that's one of the things I do. I'd like sit there and visualize myself presenting. And the more I do that, I find the better results I get. What about you, Jeff? Um, I don't, I, I, I'm a, probably a, a blend here of what Venkat said and yourself. I subscribe to the little finger school of thought, which is fight every battle everywhere all at once. You'll never be surprised. So to me, that's about preparation. So, you know, for example, the podcast, you know, I have meticulous detail that I put into this to try to solve or anticipate every single issue that could pop up. Now, there's always something new that pops up, <laughs> right? But it's kind of like, okay, let me visualize how this is going to work or, you know, in this case, listen to how this might work or whatever it might look like. And, you know, the same thing I think for the podcast, like preparation, if I'm speaking, you know, if I'm playing, you know, basketball or something like that, sure, research my opponent, you know, do they tend to break left, break right? Do they prefer a fadeaway jumper versus a hook shot versus do they do a Euro step and want to cross you up, right? Things like that. I think there's, there's intelligence that you can gather and is part of the reconnaissance to so say, okay, what am I, what opponent am I facing? Now I sort of know what to expect. Now, how am I going to counter that? Okay. Whether it's basketball, you know, speaking in front of a crowd or doing a podcast. Okay. Well, I know that, you know, I want to have good lighting because the camera is going to be on, or I want to have a good microphone because, you know, this is going to happen, or I want to have my notes prepared because we're going to have somebody really, really smart, like Venkat on, and I don't want to look like an idiot, <laughs> right? Things like that. So I, 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 again, it goes back to that little finger thought from Game of Thrones, preparation. You know, visualize, prepare for every potential outcome. And you can't, it's, it's more difficult to be surprised. So if you're playing basketball against Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and you know <laughs> he has a killer skyhook, yep. what are you going to do, punch him in his knee? No, I mean, well, there's obviously <laughs> quite a height advantage there that <laughs> he would have over me, but, you know, he would, he had the skyhook and, you know, there, it was almost unblockable for people in the NBA. I mean, it was, it was really down to his execution and anything you can, you can put in front of him to disrupt either the timing or the execution was the important part. He yeah, was going to be a, able to get over you. That's a good point, Jim. This is about risk management, right? You give Kareem his points, but he stopped the others, right? You still win the game. Mm -hmm. That's a good Hopefully. point. You hear that in sports a lot. Don't let the superstar be the one that beats yeah, you. Take I mean, the superstar out of the game and let, let the rest of the team beat you. And if that happens, that happens. But it's exactly. a good strategy. Mm hmm all right, that's a good spot. We'll leave it for this week. Uh, if you want to learn more about Stack Identity, you can find them on the web, stackidentity.com slash IDAC. It's a nice little landing page where you've got a bunch of different links to talk about everything or go to everything that we talked about, including Sarah, the Shadow, assist, uh, shadow Access Risk Assessment. Assessment. Uh, Venkat's office hours and just getting more information. And of course, you guys will be at RSA. Again, the North Expo Hall, booth N6564. And you can always connect with Venkat on LinkedIn. We'll have a link, bunch of links in our show notes as well. So make it easy for people to find. And they'll also be on our website. And then, of course, you can always reach out to Jim and I. We're, all, we're both on LinkedIn. We're always curious to see what people think. If they have ideas or, uh, you know, uh, direction on how they'd like to see things go in the future, uh, that's something we're always open to. So uh, don't forget to visit us on the web, idacpodcast.com. Check out our still growing YouTube channel. And the link to that will be on our website as well. So with that, we'll leave it. Thanks everyone for listening. Venkat, thank you so much for taking the time with us uh, today. And we'll talk with everyone in the next one. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jim, for having me. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.